Okay, so we're going to talk about the uh, cations, group 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and we're going to explain what this means. This is ultimately has to do with something known as qualitative analysis, which allows you to, without actually computing numbers, determine which metals may, may be present in a mixture, a solution mixture that you may be provided with. In fact, this is something we're going to be applying to one of the labs later. But um, this is pretty much the idea. When you look at the metals, you could actually subdivide them into groups. The groups are actually related to the chemistry which allows these metals to be precipitated out of solution. So the group one metals, as you can see, are uh, just a handful of them and they tend to be uh, the heavy metals in addition to silver. These are the metals that tend to precipitate very easily upon addition of halogens like chloride, bromide, or iodide. And so those are your group one elements and those are the ones that come out of solution first when you just apply you know, addition of sodium chloride, let's say, to it. That's why we call them group one. They're the first ones that precipitate out of solution. After that, you get your group two elements, which are the, the ones in slight brown uh, coloration. You know, this it looks a little bit more red than brown, but yes, the elements down here, which tend to be a little bit heavier, um, but they have a tendency to precipitate out as well. Not as high as the group one metals, but a little bit higher than the rest of them. Uh, so you can get those elements out after you get your group 1A metals to come out of solution. Beyond that, you get to the group 3 elements, which represents a good chunk of the transition metals and pretty much your lanthanides and actinides. Those elements will precipitate um, afterwards upon adding a specific set of chemicals. And so you basically end up separating the group of metals um, one, one step at a time. And by the end, you get to group five. Uh, those are pretty much the elements that remain in solution the entire time through. So you don't necessarily get them out of solution, but those will be the ones left over after you apply all the chemical changes. All right, so I want to show you specifically how this happens. Let's start with the group one. All right, so that's silver, mercury, thallium, and lead. All you need to do is add a little bit of HCl, and not super concentrated, you know, 0.3 molar does the trick. And um, what ends up happening is that for this particular element, the presence of chloride automatically precipitates those specific metal cations. So you adding sodium chloride or even hydrochloric acid will precipitate those particular metal um, ions. And we know that because each one of these individual complexes has a KSP associated with it, right? Now, for some of them, like mercury, the KSP is a lot larger, or excuse me, a lot smaller than for things like thallium or lead. That's going to have some consequences, as you'll see in a little bit. Now, speaking of metals, one thing that we also do know in regards to these transition metals and chloride is that we could actually form coordination complexes that happen to be anionic. And so you actually have a competing factor taking place right here. On the one hand, the addition of chloride to the metal cations can generate something that is neutral, basically a neutral salt that will precipitate out of solution. But for some of them, if you have either too much chloride or if you start raising the temperature a bit too much, you may actually solubilize them by forming the eight species, right? The tetrachloromethylate species. Um, and so, as you can see for lead, uh, something's going to happen that's rather interesting. On the one hand, yes, you do have a KSP associated with the formation of the salt, but the formation of the anionic complex is, you know, even more um, favor than just keeping it at the solid state. Uh, so, if you actually add up these two equations, I'm going to show you what happens. Yes, the lead two pluses cancel out, and the two chlorides cancel out, leaving you only with two extra chlorides here for your balance equation. So you have lead uh, two chloride plus two extra chlorides giving you the tetrachloroplumbate ion. And since all we did here is just add the two equations, all we need to do is multiply the two equilibrium constants, the Ksp times the Kf, meaning that you end up with an equilibrium constant that's favored in the product. So what actually ends up happening for lead is that if you combine lead 2 plus with HCl at room temperature, you will see a precipitate. You will definitely see that precipitate. 
but then all it takes is for you to heat it up a little you know a little bit probably you have to go up to like 50 60 degrees celsius but you heat it up and what's up happening is that that solution that contains the precipitated lead actually redissolves back and the reason it redissolves back is because when you apply some heat all you're doing is providing enough energy to go over the activation energy that it's uh, present to go from the solids back to the complex ion and so with that extra energy provided all you're doing is now giving the reaction enough energy to go past the activation energy and go to the final product that it really wants to go to you know that this product is ultimately a thermodynamic sink for the reaction because it has a pretty high value for the equilibrium constant so if we actually apply this equation and try to perform a, an ice table uh, approach to figure out the concentrations um, so we're going to assume that yes this is going to go to completion because the value of k is much larger than one uh, the let chloride being a solid doesn't make it into the equilibrium expression so it's a zero uh, so the only two things we need to worry about is the chloride concentration and the tetrachloral plumbate concentration Initially, the Cl- concentration is 0.3 molar. We don't have anything for the tetrachloral plumbate salt, so that starts at zero. And if this goes to completion, well, pretty much you will get rid of all 0.3 molar concentration of chloride. And of course, this assumes that you have a lot of or enough of the lead chloride for the chloride to be the limiting reactant. But for every two moles of chloride, you only produce one mole of tetrachloroplumbate so you will only be producing 0.5 molar concentration for the tetraplumbate so once again pay attention to your proportions don't just go based on what we did for the titration of acids and bases which is one to one uh, ratios here it does change all right so basically this will give you the the new initial values right 0.15 molar for the tetraplumbate salt uh, zero for chloride and then what we do is we take that equation and we reverse it. And by reversing it, I want you to pay attention to this. The equilibrium constant, the entire equilibrium constant has to be raised to the negative one power. So this is no longer 4.25. Uh, so if you made the mistake of just simply changing the exponent to a negative and you keep it as 4.5 times 10 to negative 10, you're gonna get the wrong answer because raising this whole thing to the negative one power doesn't yield 4.25 anymore it now yields 2.35 times 10 to the negative 11. all right so what we do now is we set up a proper ice table um, we already know the initial concentration of the tetrachloroplumbate ion uh, the chloride concentration initially is zero because we drove everything to completion the change in concentration will be in minus x for the tetrachloroplumbate and plus 2x for the chloride Okay, now um, chloride is your new product that needs to be square. The tetrachloroplumbate goes on the bottom. Uh, but because the value of the equilibrium constant is so much smaller than the initial concentration, we're going to assume that the minus x is negligible. And so all we need to do now is multiply the 2.35 times 10 to negative 11 by 0.15. That gives the 8.81 times 10 to negative 13 value. And we take the square root of both sides and we find out that the change in the concentration is 9.39 times 10 to the negative 7 which if we multiply that value by 2 this will give us the value of the chloride concentration and by doing that we finally found the equilibrium concentrations of all the species in question all right so these results are actually consistent with you know ksp being in equilibrium with the tetrachloroplumbate salt the only thing that's getting in the way of going directly to the tetrachloroplumbate salt is the activation energy of this reaction, which you can um, get around by raising the temperature of the reaction mixture. Right, so that's basically all the concepts brought together into one. We have the equilibrium taking place. We have your thermodynamics, you know, also explaining some of it via the Hess's law. We are uh, looking at KSP, K formations, and in addition to that, we are now invoking the activation energy the kinetics of the reaction to tell us why is it that we don't go directly to the soluble tetrachloroplumbate salt and instead we get stuck initially with the in, you know precipitated salt so as you can see many concepts can actually apply to this stuff and at least for the tetrachloroplumbate salts yeah if you keep the concentration kind of low 
you will be stuck um, at the tetrachloroplum bay, excuse me, the lead 2 plus chloride solid. That's if you do it at room temperature. If you raise the temperature, you will ensure that you go to the tetrachloroplum bay. Another way to do it is to increase the chloride concentration to even higher concentrations. You will have to go much higher than 6 molar for this to take place at room temperature, but you could apply those changes. Okay, I'll show you um, another example. Now for silver, same idea. You're forming a silver chloride precipitate, so you could write a KSP equation for it. And just to remind you, for the KSP, the solid has to be the reactant. The soluble species are the products. Now, uh, one way to solubilize silver is to actually add ammonia to it. And the reason why is because ammonia forms a complex with silver, that your diamino, excuse me, your diamine silver ion. And so if we combine these two equations, right, add them together, the silver plus cancel out, you end up with the following equation. Silver chloride plus two ammonias yield diamine silver cation <clears throat> and your one chloride. So this means that you just multiply the Ksp by the Kf to yield a value for the equilibrium constant. So this value is not greater than one, but at the same time it's not much smaller than one. So you could actually make it happen, even though technically speaking, it still favors the reactants. But if you add high enough concentration of ammonia, you could actually push this equilibrium to favor formation of the silver cation. And by changing the concentration alone, we can actually tweak the system to make, uh, make the silver soluble. Okay, so now with all that being said, I'm going to stop the video right here and we'll continue our analysis of the group 2 metals in the next video.